Welcome to the Real Estate and Wealth Podcast, your go-to resource for navigating the world of real estate investing and wealth creation. This podcast is brought to you by Calvert Home Mortgage Investment Corporation, your trusted, caring, and responsive short-term mortgage lender in Alberta and Ontario. We explore strategic and tactical solutions to elevate your real estate portfolio, drawing insights from seasoned Canadian investors and trusted advisors. In each episode, we dive into various aspects of real estate investing, including market trends, property analysis, financing strategies, risk management, and much more. Whether you're a seasoned real estate investor looking to expand your portfolio or a beginner taking those first steps, this podcast is for you. Today on the pod, we have Josh Howes from the secondary, and he's the secondary suites program manager for the city of Calgary. Perfect. Josh, yeah, very curious. Uh, just your role, your experience, and, and kind of how your role came to be, just because uh, our audience are obviously real estate investors, and I know, obviously, suites are a huge focal point right now, just with affordability, and so many people moving to Calgary. Yeah, for sure. So um, I guess my history is I originally had an undergrad in planning, um, which led me to work start working for the city about 13 years ago. I started on the front counter, call center. Um, people call that role kind of the front counter role. Um, after about two years of that, I moved into a leadership role within the area, change management role, which led to the coordinator for the area for a couple of years. Uh, I spent the last four years leading up to this job um, as the executive advisor to the director of development, business and building services. Um, and then I was asked to take this on. So about a year ago, I uh, took on the role of program manager for secondary suites. So. Awesome. Can you talk a little bit about the secondary suite program and what the ultimate goal is? Um, maybe touch on the registry as well. Yeah, for sure. So if we go back in history a little bit on suites, which I think is important, back before 2015, suites were really just an anomaly. They were difficult to get. Actually, leading back to that, all the history of Calgary, and we had less than 500 legal suites back going back before 2015, wow. um, which is kind of wild when you think about it. And 2015 triggered the first non-mandatory uh, optional suite registry. So that launched in 2015. Um, in 2018, it became a mandatory registry. And at that time, we had about a thousand suites on the registry. So mandatory became a thousand. Um, at the same time, we approved. And what I like to say is we actually finally got out of the way. City at the time leading up till that, there were a lot of city parcels in the city of Calgary, residences, houses that had suites or wanted suites that were not allowed to have a suite. Um, your option was to try and get a redesignation for your land use at this at city council, six months, whatever else, the sob stories that everybody heard of. And so the city addressed that issue in 2018 truly by making it so that 99% of residential properties across the city could now qualify for a secondary suite. And so because it was so hard before, there was an entire underground market of, of suites that were built and developed without uh, proper procedure, proper process, and certainly without the safety requirements. And so that has become one of the key focuses for the Secondary Suites program. Starting back in 2018, up until now, there's been little offshoots of attempts. Um, an amnesty program was approved where we have now extended it till the end of 2026, which allows for the fees for the development permit to be cleared and waived. Um, it also allows for suites that existed prior to March of 2018 to qualify under a slightly different set of requirements. Specifically, the main one that everybody talks about or that matters is um, not requiring separate heat or separate air systems for the suite versus upstairs because when it exists and everything's already all done, it gets extremely expensive to do that. Um, so that is the one key element that, that defines a suite that qualifies under the amnesty program versus maybe one that doesn't, um, which is a suite that either doesn't exist yet or was built since 2018 or had certain renovations done to it since then. And so those are the two main kind of suites that we deal with um, in support of. Uh, the registry is now peaking up over 15,000 suites on the registry. So it's been a huge uptake over the last number of years, at least from our perspective. But we also recognize that, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, and so this program was kind of put together overarching to, you know, to finish this work that we started in terms of trying to get those that exist that haven't had the opportunity to legalize and register yet to come on board and to make those changes. We moved to a new inspection model with the program. And so basically we have plans examiners acting also as the inspector. So the person that reviews your initial file for a suite that existed prior to 2018 is the same person that comes out and inspects your location. Just cleaned up some of the, the, the differences that we had between those two that allows us to create a bit of a customer relationship and help 
walk people through that process because often it's the first and only time they do it um, and it can be really scary. So that's part of the program. We've launched that. We've also launched now an incentive. And so the incentive was approved by council May 29th. Um, it launched June 3rd of this year. And essentially the incentive is to provide uh, funds to help cover the costs, not intended to cover the full cost of a, of a suite renovation, um, but to help cover the costs uh, specifically of, of the key safety elements that exist in a suite. If we were to walk through them quickly, we talk egress windows. So there's money available if you needed to change out your windows to make them fully egress. Uh, there's money available for hardwired, interconnected smoke and fire alarms, which are a requirement. There's money available for a smoke seal. Um, most people refer to this as drywall in the furnace room because it's the most uncommon thing to do. Um, so we don't often see that unless obviously people are taking that attempt, but there's funds available for that. A little bit more, uh, less common is uh, protected exits. Depending on where the exit for the suite is, it may need to be covered or separated from windows or other openings from the upstairs. And then the last piece, um, which doesn't isn't a requirement if the suite existed prior to 2018 and if it qualifies under the amnesty program, um, which is separate heat and air uh, circulation systems. And so those are the five key elements that we look at. And if you do need them all, uh, you'll qualify for $10,000. If you need a certain combination of them, it might be a little bit less. Uh, but basically, if you have smoke seal and uh, a need for split heat and, and, and air, you'll qualify for the full amount. Um, and then you qualify for things that are not yet complete. So if those elements are already finished within the home, then, then you wouldn't qualify for those funds. But if they aren't, then the city's able to reimburse you some funds um, based off of showing proof of those things. A um, couple other key elements is that there's only one available per person. Um, you do have to be either the owner or sole proprietor uh, of the property in order to qualify. Uh, you can't owe taxes to the city. Um, we'll make sure that that you pay the city first, <laughs> okay. um, which is which is fine. There is a, a learning program, an online learning program. It's available to anybody, but uh, it is a requirement to the program, um, which is just great to help inform people, makes people more uh, prepared to do a good job of the suite, which helps us, obviously. So that's part of it. And yeah, we just confirm ownership at the start and at the finish. And I think that some people kind of read and gloss over that, but it is actually important to note that you do have to be the owner at the start and at the finish of the process. That helps us make sure that we're, we're attending to the, the group of individuals that we're trying to support with this program. So, so that's the incentive. It, it has launched. Um, it is active and live, open for applications. We have funding from both the city as well as the federal government for the program. So we're ready to take lots of applications in and help people out. Awesome. Sounds like a really great incentive. And you shared a lot of really good information, so a lot to unpack there. Yeah. Uh, but let's let's go back to development versus building permit, sure. and when you would need a development permit versus just a building permit for your suite. Sure. So we're weeks away from the possibility that um, ninety percent of development permits will no longer be required. So if uh, you know rezoning goes through, one of the effects of that will be that suites will become permitted in all residential parcels. Um, if you're permitted and you follow the rules, no need for a development permit. The key rule that's left, honestly, for suites is parking stall. If you're aware of what's happening with RCG, there's actually also some pockets of RCG uh, that will only require an additional half a stall for a suite, which actually means that the overall parcel will move from needing two stalls to just needing one. If that happens, the chance of needing a relaxation for development permit or a permit development permit to attain a relaxation for that parking stall goes down significantly. If it's permitted, that's about the only thing that you break with development permit. Everybody has an amenity space that they can provide and there's not really much else. And so from that perspective, right now we see development permits for about 40 to 45% of suites. If those changes go through, we will see from, you know, down from 800 down to like a dozen or something. Wow. Um, there is a couple of other sub effects. If you're in the AVPA, which is the airport vicinity um, area, you, you may require a suite. Um, if you're in the flood fringe, flood mm -hmm. areas, you also require a development permit. There's other things that get reviewed at those stages, but the majority of suites will go through without. The development permit is truly getting that approval from a land use perspective, making sure that your space is right now. Going back a decade, there were very few parcels that allowed for suites. It wasn't allowed in most land uses. Um, and so now that it is, not only is it allowed, it's discretionary in RC1. So those are the key ones that currently get a development permit still. But if those change to permitted, then you'll see uh, a huge reduction in the requirements for a DP. 
right now the development permit is actually covered under the amnesty program so we don't charge any fees for that uh, it does take about three months to go through the process and then there are some times where we determine that it's not appropriate for the suite in that type of space so that's that's what that development permit approval is for and then obviously the building permit then is all about the so the code the safety elements the actual construction making sure it's completed um, so that's the split between the two but yeah we are in an interesting time to see whether or not yeah. DP and suites <laughs> are really even a thing anymore or whether or not we're kind of past that. That's a really yeah. big change. Sounds it could like be. Yeah. It's going to be really good we'll for see. the timeline and the work on your end. Very so potentially, yeah, it yeah. could reduce the timeline for people by about three months. Yeah, yeah. that's huge. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, I know you touched on it a little bit, but in terms of, I want to get it right. So the amnesty program. So what is the difference between adding a suite from scratch and something that would qualify under that program. Can you just touch on what you need to do when you use that program versus when you add something from scratch? Yeah, that's a great question. So basically, if your suite has been in existence since before March of 2018, it may qualify under the amnesty program. And essentially what that means is we're saying, hey, before you could legally do this, it was put in, which means that we're in a space where it's, it's going to be potentially more expensive for you to attain the current requirements than it would have been had you been able to accomplish that prior to. And so the province, uh, in, in conjunction with the province, we have a kind of a compliance path that exists essentially for people that qualify under that program, which removes the requirement of having a separate heating system uh, for the basement, for the suite versus the, the upper units, which avoids taking down drywall and putting new Duct worked in, which avoids the requirement of a second furnace, if that's the most common way of doing it. Um, but basically, that whole chunk and requirement um, is, is, isn't required. The other smaller one that does come up from time to time is there is requirements for sound um, channeling between the bedrooms and the upstairs. Um, and that is a requirement also that isn't isn't required once again for the same reason. Yeah. It's all built, it's there. It costs a lot to take it down to put some sound bar up um, versus if you're building from scratch, it's not a heavy cost. So that's something that's required in the current version, but this compliance pass path allows for you to do it without that. Um, that's if you're existing prior to 2018. That also means that you haven't done any significant pieces of work. So if a new entrance was put in, for instance, in 2020, well, you don't qualify under the amnesty program anymore because you did renovations and made changes to it within the new code. Once you knew it was there, when you were had the ability to properly apply, and maybe you did or you didn't, or the suite itself did couldn't have existed until say that door went in, well then it can't have existed prior to 2018. You see a lot of homes that existed only after 2018, they don't qualify under the program. And slowly over time, while the majority of houses on the registry right now still come from that status of amnesty program, on a, on a monthly, yearly basis now, we actually see a higher quantity of, of uh, suites being registered that follow the full compliance cycle and didn't qualify under the amnesty program. Is that a lot from the newer developments? It is, yeah. yeah, yeah. We see right now about one third of new single family homes right now in the city of Calgary are having a suite put in from scratch from the yeah. builder, wow. um, which is an incredibly high number. Last year, that was even a, a pipe dream, but this is what we're seeing currently knows how long that yeah. lasts, yeah. I guess. But yeah, I think it shows just the, the nature of the need and, and the opportunity that it provides uh, people flexibility in, in what they're doing and the costs. I mean, when you do it from scratch with that as your intention, the costs come significantly down. You design the space so that it has the proper entrance, proper separations. You can put two furnaces in to begin with. All these things are so much easier from scratch. Um, it's also partly why the, the program actually kind of doesn't support um, so the incentive doesn't actually support that type of construction uh, ownership at the start and at the finish of the process with a general builder it doesn't actually fit um, and that's by design because there are other advantages that those suites are having and in fact they're a hot topic and a hot product right now we don't need to incentivize those we're focused on on the existing stock that is there and that needs the potentially the support because the costs are, are significant mm -hmm. And the $10,000 incentive that you current, uh, currently have for the suite, is that just a, sh a short-term initiative or is that going to be long-term or what's kind of the timeline on yeah, That's a good question. Talk of an incentive started about 18 months ago. I've visually and, and experienced, you know, a good six solid iterations of what the incentive should look like. What should an incentive look like? Um, we did a jurisdictional scan. There are uh, province like BC, the province of BC itself has a program. Um, 
there were cities across the, the country that have programs. The federal government in the most recent budget suggested that they're launching a secondary suite program. So there is all sorts of different takes and initiatives. Right now, this is a cash incentive. Um, there's no, not really a lot of strings attached at all. Like once you've registered, you get the funds and you're done. You don't have to rent first to a specific person or a piece or lower than volume. There's no payback yeah. periods. It's just uh, nice and simple, really, honestly. Um, and it's, it's supported through the budget that we currently have. We do have two sides to that budget, like I mentioned previously. Every year from the, from the municipal government, we receive a, sun, a set of funds that have uh, put that in. Councils agreed to that, um, and that goes forward in perpetuity as, as of right now. Um, there's also a, a, fun, a set of funds from the Housing Accelerator Fund. And so right now in the designs, we believe we have funding for about three years, um, but there's certainly that could change, that could reduce, yeah. <laughs> we could spend it faster, yeah. we could get to the end and there could be more funds made available. It depends on the success, I think. It depends on the demand for the program um, after that period of time. But hypothetically, we feel as though we have funding for about three years currently set in place. Um, and, and we think that we could probably incentivize somewhere in the range of like six to 7,000 suites through the incentive program, separate from the ones that will be registered without it. And so that's kind of the angle. Uh, last year, we did about 2,900 on the registry. Our goal for this year is 4,500, and we're well on track for that with the incentive program in place. And so that would be an increase of about 1,600, and that's the incentive working to get extra suites registered and, and safe mm -hmm. within the city. So yeah, we, we right now designs three years. Amazing. Do Amazing. you have an estimate of how many unregistered suites are in Calgary at all? Such a fun question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm sure it's hard to. Yeah, you know, this is a great history on this. Back to 2015, formally to council back in 2015, they were using some old um, census data. And at that time, basically went around and they, they asked everybody and everybody that openly admitted to a census person that they had a suite that wasn't registered, they counted. And at that time, they had like 20,000 that they figured were out there. And we were like, okay, but um, more recently, we've used a couple different ways of doing it. Um, we've looked at some different ways. But basically, what we've done over the last while is, is we look at what's available for rent that's offered, that's registered versus unregistered. And we take a bit of a percentage of that and you say, okay, we have 15,000 on the registry. We're seeing about 30 to 40% registered is available to the public. That means that I estimate somewhere between 25, maybe 30,000 um, suites or, uh, that are out there that aren't registered. That number doesn't seem any lower than it was back, you know, however long ago. But what we've seen is, well, a lot of those have been registered. There is still push to build more without registering. And so every time we register one that wasn't and that was, you know, either illegal or, or whatnot, it's possible that somebody's putting one in. So one of the keys to the incentive program is actually to really take a look at people that are considering putting a suite in and to have them think, wait, doing this properly now makes sense. Not only is it worth more on the resale, not only do I avoid fines and fees from the city, I also have this opportunity to get a little bit of money to help cover the additional costs. Whereas if I put it in illegally and leave these safety elements out, I could save money, but in the long term, it starts to catch up. And so one of the keys of the incentive is actually catching those people that would have built an illegal and convincing them that registering and building it properly is actually a better way to go. And so we are hoping that that number, whether it stays, starts to shrink, but certainly we don't want it to be growing. Um, and the incentive's a key piece to that. And what are kind of the repercussions if there's been a house for 40 years, it's been in an illegal suite, yeah. what are some of the negative repercussions or yeah. that, that could occur if someone's caught? For or... sure, yeah, it's a good question. Um, what is that kind of, yeah, just the process. I think, I think the key for the city, especially going back to 2015 through to 2018, where you saw like, hey, it really feels like the city was working against people. Um, whether it was intentional or not, it's just the reality. It felt like it was really hard to do what was right because the city made it difficult. Since we've removed that, at least in my opinion, the city's done a great job of now actually allowing for the space. And, and actually, I would say Calgarians and, and investors have responded. They've responded in 15,000 registered suites, uh, you know, which is, which is fantastic. And I think that that actually shows that some of that limitation truly was the municipal requirements that just made it difficult to do properly. And now that we've taken that and gotten that out of the way, people are willing to take the steps, the proper steps. And so from that perspective, um, I think... I think we've made a lot of progress there, but I've actually forgotten your question a little bit. Uh, repercussions if someone right, gets right. caught, like, yeah, with right. an illegal suite. Like, yeah, yeah, perfect. So 
what I would say though is that there was a mindset change from the city. In 2018, when we said, okay, let's allow this, we said, hey, let's help people, let's educate them, and let's get them registered. Let's not find them and chase them and whatever else. Um, and so through this process, we, we worked to help and support people across the line. Certainly, there are still certain circumstances where if we see a safety concern that we just cannot ignore, just can't, then we will require um, the changes made to that and, uh, you know, going as far as we need to through our enforcement model that we need to. We are aware of people that are working towards registration and it's taken maybe longer than we would have hoped. We continue to encourage them along the way. But at the end of the day, there is always a point in which the city um, says, hey, like, you know, had the opportunity, this is still a space that is unsafe and unregistered. So, yeah, there's really three prongs to it. Technically, development has fees and fines. We have a registration fee and fine, as well as building from a safety perspective. And, and that moves to orders and charges and, and those types of pieces. So the city does have our enforcement model. But actually, what we like to do is in, in, in educate people. When you have a space that's unregistered and not safe, you carry a lot of extra liability. It could be that your insurance is not actually covering what it needs to, which means in the case of a catastrophic loss, you could actually be out because your insurance company isn't going to cover something that you're not that you're not properly paying for or that wasn't built properly potentially. So you carry a lot of liability, actually, um, certainly in some of the unfortunate fatals that have happened in illegal basement suites. Individuals have been uh, charged and fined hundreds of thousands of dollars associated with those situations because you are responsible as the owner of a property to make sure that people in there are in a safe space. And if you've been, you know, unknowingly or intentionally left them in a space that doesn't hit the minimum requirements of safety, you carry a lot of liability. And so when I look at what the city can do from a fee and fine perspective, sure, it can be impactful. And but I think that when people realize what they are actually holding could potentially sink them. I think that that's actually a much better motivator. And so we really just from an education first perspective, from a support, giving you help along the way to make sure that you're able to register is really the city's primary goal. Um, but I can't say that, you know, next council meeting, somebody yeah. won't come forward with the request that says, hey, we have to get on top of these where, you know, as a city, we're not doing enough. You need to push that model. And if that's the case, at any given time, we could start to shift to a much more proactive uh, enforcement model. Um, right now, we're still much in the let's work together phase. But I yeah, which is awesome. Kind of dangling the carrot as opposed to being yeah. blocked by a stick. Kind yeah, of but I think somewhere incentive. along the way, I can only uh, whether I'll be here or I'll yeah. be gone. <laughs> somewhere along the way, I think that you'll expect. And, and we've always theorized, honestly that when a certain threshold is hit on the registry, maybe not in our current temperature around, you know, rentals and whatnot, yeah. but somewhere along the way that people will start to expect and demand that a space that they're about to rent and stay in is registered. Um, right now, that didn't exist as a requirement. If you were a renter and you were requiring registered suites in 2015, good luck. Yeah. Um, but as time has gone and as the pool of registered safe suites starts to grow, it can certainly become something that is demanded by the market. And when the demand shifts to say, hey, I'm uninterested in that property because it's not registered, then we hope that that actually pushes the market as well a little bit. What that threshold is, I can't say for sure. Mm -hmm. I would suspect on the next you know, bus cycle, we'll probably see a significant number of illegal suites empty um, because as people are given choice, that'll be a factor that they look at and say, hey, I could rent there or there and that's registered. And that's an easy choice for a lot of people. So we hope that the, you know, that the that general population essentially accomplishes that for us at some point in time. Um, but I wouldn't say we're quite there yet. I think that right now people are willing to live anywhere. Anyway, yeah, especially with get, the affordability. But, I mean, I've been around long enough and you guys are in this business yeah. to know that that's not always going to be the case. Mm -hmm. And and there's different factors. Um, we had a survey that went out to renters actually late last year associated with what matters to you. And we saw that that cost was still higher than the safety. So when they were looking at rental suites right now, the cost still matters. And that was a higher matter than their safety. But let's say two years from now, we could pull that same group of people. And it could be that registered or safe suites are above cost in terms of what matters, you know, location, whatever, all these different factors. Um, it does matter to people. Just wondering when it will you know, jump to the top of people's lists. Uh, certainly as a father, I know that if, you know, my kids were about to leave the nest and go out on their own, 
I'd be interested in what type of a space they were staying in and I'd be interested to see it on the registry. Right. So that's the type of thing we're looking for. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, if you're a landlord or a homeowner with a suite, you want to make sure it's safe for the people who are living there, like the liability aspect and just, you know, caring about the occupant. So I think it's really good that you're willing to work with them on that uh, registration of the suite. Um, Well, I'm just curious, what were the top three? Oh gosh! Yeah, I'd have to pull it off. Yeah, I'd have to pull it off. Yeah, um, yeah. The survey we we actually talked to homeowners of illegals, owners of registered suites, and then renters. And so we had a a, a bit of a pull from everybody. There's a what we heard report. Uh, I was just signing off on it uh, today over the next little bit that will be posted. So there was a an engaged survey that's on, so you can still find this online. Um, that asks this shows the questions that were asked, and now we have like a what we're doing kind of response report that's being formally published. So I guess it would kind of be built into yeah. that. Um, I don't know if we ever like published exactly like the one, two, three, four. Yeah. But yeah, I can say we had about seven elements and safety came into the top three. And that was for renters specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, it's interesting too, like the difference between those with unregistered versus registered suites and what mattered to them as well. Um, but we are starting to see that shift, especially. And and we did find too from registered suite homeowners uh, that they that you know that they found it was easier to rent. Uh, that they felt like they were getting more for the value for their for the rental. Um, we see it more so on the sale, obviously, um, with the way that real estate sure. requirements yeah. are, where you cannot, um, you know, advertise an illegal without specifically stating that. Um, and I'll say, like, there's hypothetically an endless pool of places that the city could be made aware of. So, I mean, when when the timing's right, I think that you'll see us um, working towards getting all of that legalized as well. But when you go to sell, you know, however much more your realtor thinks you can get for a, for a registered suite versus not, but it's certainly not a small amount. And it's, mm-hmm. it's certainly an amount that makes a difference for people. And when people are moving in and flipping properties, they see that, that boost, you know, you take for a sure. property, you put some investment, sure it's nicer, it's prettier, whatever, but if it's safer, that increase on your sale on the other end mm-hmm. is, is, is significant, um, potentially well above how much you spent on the safety elements. Yeah. I know it definitely helps with mortgage qualification as well too. Having that yeah. legal, legal suite. Because then it counts as two units versus the market rent for just the full house. Yeah, Yeah, that's definitely Mm -hmm. important. Especially right now, because I mean, basement (laughs) affordability is is huge, right? Like that's a huge chunk for people. Mm -hmm. And I think we see that in the newer city or the newer properties that are putting suites in. So often it's for the purpose of the mortgage, right? Qualification. Actually, that leaves us. Yeah. (laughs) Bad space later, but right now it's certainly helpful. Yeah. 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 (laughs) What does the decision hierarchy kind of look like to make changes to your programs like do you just do you meet on a quarterly basis if if, if something major addressed like hey we need to update either your incentive programs or what does it look like in terms of how you frequently you update what the decision looks like and, and who's involved yeah so the program itself i think a lot of people think it's the incentive that's just one one of the elements yeah Yeah. one of the components i'd say that we probably had six um, approved kind of for launch back in September, um, kind of had six key elements. Um, the realignment to the team and, and stuff was kind of one of the main pieces. Uh, the incentive is one of them, uh, next steps on, on enforcement model and whatnot is one of them, but we also have on there adjustments and changes to right now we have a sticker. We want to review whether or not the sticker is the right way to go. Um, we're looking on collaborations with fire on potentially adding some, um, some information for those that are occupants of a space. Um, right now, we do all the work with those building the safe space, uh, for instance, egress windows. And then, you know, you get in there and somebody decides now they're going to put bars up on the windows. And it's like, okay, well, they weren't aware that there's a specific reason that you have an egress yeah. window and that bars mean that that is no longer a safe egress. Um, so we are working to make sure that we inform the occupants of a space, basically, hey, the reason your fire alarm is going off is because something happened upstairs. And while it might be annoying because they just burnt toast that is what could save your life in the case of a fire upstairs, right? And so we wanna we want to collaborate with fire, make sure we're getting that information out and we're looking at how maybe the registry sticker or what you're required to keep up in the house maybe is updated so that it carries some of that information. Um, so that's on there. There's a couple other smaller elements, mm-hmm. some things that we're interested in. Um, yeah, what, which group we're going for next, who, whether it be who we're marketing the incentive to or who we're aiming our enforcement at, um, what that looks like. Um, always trying to manage our volume versus the team size that we have. 
So those are some elements. I would say in general, we're fairly agile. We're a small team and we don't have years of hierarchical, like, you know, mess to deal with. That being said, there are certain things if we need council approval, getting council approval is mm -hmm. still takes just as long as it yeah. always does. And so, yeah, so the incentive program, for instance, I mean, like I say, iteration starting back in August of last year, a final approval in June, it can take a while for the more yeah. formal things. I will say this, like the incentive terms of reference, the way that they were written, they do require us to have a bit of a review after a year to say, hey, are we hitting our right markets and whatnot? And there is some room within there to make adjustments and changes with, with more of an administrative approval rather than requiring uh, council approval formally. So it depends on how big of a change that we needed to make. And then obviously how much money we have would affect our decisions. You know, if we're running low, we might make an adjustment. If we're still well-funded, then, then we might continue or even potentially open things up depending on, on how many, how many suites that we're able to afford. And so I, I would view us right now as, as a fairly agile team that's able to respond to the requirements of our customers, but we do have limitations yeah, um, yeah. and, and some things, which is, which is good too, because people are making huge decisions and we don't want to just like, you know, up and turn off the program all of a sudden one day when people have put investments into expecting that. And so, yes, there's some security around the incentive. We'll tell people months ahead of time before we turn it off, like, hey, we're on track to run out by the end of X, you know, uh, or if we, we did say that if we were going to be oversaturated for a period of time, we might turn it off for a bit and turn it back on. Once again, we do the same thing. We're not just going to suddenly one day you go onto a register and it's not there. We'll communicate. We'll have a period of time and then we'll say, hey, we'll turn it off. We'll turn it back on when we can. Here's the timelines and stuff. So we're not going to make any rash, quick decisions yeah. around that. Yeah. So hopefully that that gives people the kind of security they need to make good investment decisions. But at the same time, we like to think of ourselves as being able to react to the requirements and the needs of the market mm -hmm. and move from there. I really like the idea of the fire safety package. I know mm. I provide my tenants with a welcome package with some information, but I will do inspections and see stuff all around the furnace, like stored yeah. up against it. And, you know, it would be really good for people to know about what's safe and what's not because some people just don't know. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. And I think like that's that's one of the spots where like our team hasn't really had to deal with before. Like from a building development perspective, you know, we get to the end and we do a final inspection and we say like, you're good. And, and for the next 30 years, it could be that no one else from the city in any way, shape or form attends that location. Well, yeah, there's a lot to know that like, hey, maybe when this was built, it was done right. But what has happened over time? What did the last tenant do that you're not even aware wasn't supposed to be done? And then that's, you know, some of the concerns. And I mean, fire is a little bit more active on that type of thing. And that's where we just thought, hey, maybe if we were able to collaborate with them, um, we could we could work with them to inform occupants of some of the safety features essentially of their home and encourage them to to make sure that they're with you know upheld right that they keep right. that going you know some like for instance we're requiring locks on the door so that there's a privacy element between up and down mm -hmm. and, and you know that's an important thing for people to recognize that that when you have a separate space and, and you're in the lower then you want to make sure that you have that seal and that that security right and so we want to encourage people to to recognize those elements and then make sure that they are left in place do you ever see yourself revoking any registrations or coming back and checking on them in the future? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, originally, the program launched with a five-year plan for renewal. When we were coming up on that opportunity to start the renewal plan, we were trying to say, like, how do we add value through this? Why is it, you know, just not a paper-pushing episode where we just, you know, I charge people money and then they're registered for another five years? And what we found is actually we were better off moving towards a model where we could work with Alberta Health Services specifically, but also FIRE to say, hey, yeah, we can actually take people off the registry if it's found that their space and location no longer is safe for occupancy. And that can come from FIRE or health, whoever it may be. And so we can we can do that. Obviously, it can go back on as long as those conditions and stuff are met. But we actually shifted from a just a paid renewal to a model where we can pull you off of the registry if you're not meeting the minimum standards, which is fantastic because we don't want to be advertising a registered suite that we're aware doesn't, you know, that Alberta Health wouldn't allow somebody to live in, right? So, um, so yeah, so there was a shift from just kind of a, a five-year model to an actual proactive, we will remove people from the registry when required. Yeah, and by charging someone to renew or, or it might deter them from wanting to continue 
on right, that registry. Right, which, which is kind of, yeah. And, and in our world, like we talk about building, like so often it is you hit the standard and, and then you're good. Like yeah. we, we don't go and do a building inspection on every 1973 bungo because it's now, you know, mm-hmm. 50 years later. No, like it was built to the code and that's it. So we view it more in that terms. You've hit the required elements. We want to encourage people to know how to operate and to continue to occupy those safe spaces safely, but we don't need to just charge people money mm-hmm. to stay on a registry. Um, could be long term that if we're not growing the registry anymore, there is a need for some support. So who knows that may come back as a model. If it does, I would suggest that we'd be looking for a value add. Are we doing an audit? Are we checking 10%? What are we requiring through that process for people? Um, is it just that we want to know when people are no longer using it that way and we want to remove it? We, we'd have to have a, a reason and a rationale, I think, for it. But um, I don't think that anything that's just set it and forget it is is the best model either. So I think we found the right balance. Um, and those changes were made in, I guess, early 2023. Um, those adjustments were made. Mm-hmm. Good to know. Mm-hmm. Of the people who apply for legal suites, what are the most common reasons they don't get approved? Very few don't get approved. Yeah? I would say stalled out in construction. Um, yeah, we see people that are, are keen that get into the process, get into the program, they start construction and the costs go up. Uh, it's more than they, they thought. Yeah. yeah, which is what we heard through that survey a little bit is, you know, like, hey, the funds would help because, you know, often we run out. I think it'll be interesting to see what the feds do exactly, but it sounds like their model might be more of a, like a loan model. I'm not sure exactly how it might look kind of like the CEP program um, for energy efficiency things it might be a little bit like that for suites, which could be good because the feds have then gave money up front to people, um, which can be helpful. We are supplying the funds as an incentive, no string attached, but it is at the end of the process. So if you're struggling to afford to get those last couple of things yeah. done, we don't help you so much until you get it done. So you get it done, then we can help support. Um, I think that, and I think the other driver behind why people aren't finished is lack of contractors for sure. Rising cost of contractors, but also lack thereof. So if we look at a, a market that, you know, over the last four years, I'm going to say, I think it was about 2000, five years ago, 2600, 2300, 2900 last year. That's number of registered suites. This year we expect to hit 4,500. Okay, so an extra 1,600 suites, who built those? And is there somebody here to build those? And if we were trying to get five, 6,000 suites onto the registry next year, who's going to build them? Um, and is that, that pool of contractors available? So I think, once again, maybe that. In terms of why we would say no to somebody, not being able to provide reasonable parking on site is one of the reasons. Um, if they don't accommodate that, obviously, if you're nowhere near transit and you have no parking, that can cause a problem. Um, so there are a couple that refuse to that. People that want to do everything except they're unwilling to do the split heat. They just don't think that they can afford that or they can't do it, but they don't qualify under the amnesty program for whatever reason. Those would be people, I guess, that would say they're refused by the city. They're really not. They're just unable or unwilling to do the, worth, the things that are required to achieve it. And and I think that's with those changes in 2018. There isn't, uh, I shouldn't say there isn't a residential property. We have a couple that are out yeah. there still under direct controls and stuff that have issues. But even then, the direct controls that specifically allow f- for, say, a 2P80 model, it doesn't have suites listed, and even all the changes, it still doesn't list. We actually cover the cost the, of the land use change if all you want to do is add suites. So once again, we can't get rid of the legal process but we are actually willing to, to cover the cost of that change. So the, the 0.01% of properties that can't, mm-hmm. there is even paths for you to, to get that land use in place so that you can legalize. So yeah, there's really not much left that we say no to um, unless it's going to impact your neighbors in a negative way or you're unwilling to, to take the required steps. Yeah. Whereas in 2015, totally different. You, yeah. I sent on the phones back in 2011, 2012, and like, you know, everybody calls him, oh, my, my buddy... It's got a house. <laughs> and they're like, oh, really? Yeah, what's the address? And like how many people you said, sorry, like your best chance is to spend six months in a land use redesignation process with no guarantees for $10,000. And like that felt like a real barrier. But sure. now somebody calls in, it's like, yes, here's the steps, which is, with you. which is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. How did you get to the $10,000 number? 
Like why yeah, not five? Why not fifteen? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, five doesn't get much nowadays. I don't know what well, you would want. No, some people yeah. only get that. Um, it really yeah. came down to the cost. So when we were looking at, I say, like, say you have uh, an empty basement and you're putting a suite in. You know, we we have a good sense of how much that might cost. People can do it for you know, or you know, as low as forty five, all the way up to about you know eighty, eighty five, depending on the features and whatnot you're gonna put in. But we're like, well, you know, we're not in the game of getting the nice suite. We're just in the game of the safe suite. So we're kind of taking the low end cost of that. And we said, okay, one of the keys was like, hey, we have different people in different circumstances though. Not everybody's got this fresh brand new basement that's open, clean design or whatever else. Some people have the windows, but they have a problem with their exiting or um, they don't have egress windows right now, but exiting is no problem. Even their drywall, they got that done, no problem, but the windows are their issue. And so we were like, okay, well, how do we make sure that we're adaptive to the individual? knowing that this location needs more work than this one. Therefore, we were willing to give a little bit more here. And so by attaching the money to the safety elements, we associate it with the cost that you're actually going to see. We worked with a couple different contractors to give us some estimates. And once again, I mean, what's the difference? If you have a window that you can just cut down further, go across, slap a standard size in, your costs are going to be different than somebody that's got to build three custom windows, cut both side and up, who knows what else, right? So like, can it all be the same? Well, no, you know, your windows might cost 6,400 and yours might only cost 2,000, like we don't know. But, but we took kind of the lower range of the cost of each of those elements and said, okay, what if we were able to reimburse kind of like this percentage of what we figure their costs would be um, and as we were building through that we kind of hit the point where all the features other than this the heat were kind of covered we said okay hey if we got heat up to 10 that might be somewhere around 20 percent of the cost of somebody's build that's significant it's not it's not small but it's also not covering the cost which is not the intention of the city just trying to encourage people to take on those safety elements rather than just build the suite and leave them out basically so I mean, it, it came from some estimates from contractors, came from trying to make it so that it, not everybody got the same amount because everybody has a different, basically, situation that might cost more or less. Um, and then, you know, how do we how do we impact? So, you know, if we were, uh, you know, Calgary in 2015 and we had 400 legal suites, you might feel great if we registered 400 this year, right? That would be like, wow. So we could yeah. incentivize 400 people. Well, we take the pool of money we have to incentivize 40 400 people, we could have given a lot of money. Um, right now, though, when you're looking at 2,900 last year, we're yeah. looking for 45. If we were to give money to every one of those, we'll run out of money in the funding real fast. So we tried to find a balance where we gave enough that it was meaningful, that people would consider it, that they would change from, well, I'm just going to put it in legal to mm, actually it might be worth it to go this direction. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's not a, it's not a science. It was more yeah. than art. Yeah. Um, but I think that, yeah, even just... You know, little things like it's just kind of a bit flashy at 10 and not everybody qualifies for it, but um, it has an impact. I mean, last couple of years ago, they did the roofing rebate program. That was at like $3,000. And so we're like, well, this is a significant bump even to that. And that was a successful program. So when there's when there's available money out there for people, um, even if it is associated with reimbursing from costs that they spend, um, we still think that this is hitting. And I think so far, the evidence is that we got it exactly right mm -hmm. in terms of 1500 at this stage is exactly about how many we wanted in. That's what we can process. We're on track to see, yeah, a very good level of incentives without going too much. So I think like maybe we found the right balance. We'll have to look back two years from now yeah. and yeah. decide. And like, obviously, like, like you say, we do a review at the end of the year. And if, you know, if it's like, actually, we need to bump it up a bit or we need to bring it down, we may adjust, mm -hmm. um, but we'll see. As long as the amnesty program is still in place, I think you'll see that model where we have it for specific elements. Mm -hmm. um, if and when the amnesty program is done and we're still looking for an incentive, we may move away from that model um, because it, it might not make sense anymore to use it. But I think right now it, it accomplishes exactly what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. In terms of the amnesty program, do you, do you anticipate it getting a little bit stricter over time? I know there was a change, I think, in January 2023, where you no longer allowed sprinkler systems in the mechanical room. It's now mm -hmm. drywall. Mm -hmm. So just wondering if you think there's anything else that will get added um, over time so that it becomes more strict. And what was the reason, I guess, for the change from the sprinkler to the drywall? Yeah, so I wouldn't say necessarily that I think it will get more strict over time. I think that it'll go away eventually. Um, actually, if you watch the watch council from... Gosh, when was it? Maybe November 
remember of last year um, when we were looking for the amnesty to be extended because if it would have come to an end at the end of last year that only people applied up until then would have qualified under it um, it was extended now until 2026 which seems like forever you know in the future yeah. but we'll very quickly hit that date and when we do um, there was there was at least a couple counselors that suggested yeah I'm supportive of this time but maybe this should be the last time so already we were starting to kind of get the sense that it's like, hey, this has been good. We see and recognize that the work's not done. Let's keep going. But somewhere along the way, we probably need to end this. Um, the other thing that might happen is there might be alignment. We're advocating to the province to consider the requirements right now for a suite to say, hey, is there any space that we could soften these requirements or that there's some other requirements that are needed instead of? And so it could be that we come together. And the amnesty is not a thing anymore because, pro, you know, new codes allow for for spaces to um, to not have the full set of current, you know, split feet, split heat, split air, whatever that may be. So so there's a lot of different pieces moving, um, whether or not the amnesty itself would change. And I wouldn't view the sprinkler change that way. Basically, what there was, was there was a, an interpretation within a, a subset of the code that felt like that was an appropriate um, consideration. When it was reviewed kind of over a further period of time, they said, hey, it accomplishes some of the concerns around fires within furnace spaces, but it doesn't address the smoke. It doesn't address the ability for smoke to go from the lower unit to the upper or vice versa. And um, that separation of smoke is key uh, key minutes, seconds, whatever you want in terms of people getting out of, of their spaces. And so while it was viewed as a positive for an actual fire within that space, within that compartment, it wasn't being viewed as covering the full requirements of what the code wanted. And so that there are some people that were that were granted with that element in place and no different than any other code element, you know, stairs used to be allowed to, you know, change, rise and run. And then somewhere along the way, we said not anymore. But if you still have one of those air st old staircases, then you're fine. So people with those sprinklers in place are, are still on the registry. And it's fine. But moving forward, that subset was ju was just viewed to not accomplish the requirements. Um, and so so currently you can't unless you were approved under the approval from the sprinkler. And so that's the main change. there. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense. The, mm -hmm. the reason why it was implemented with the smoke. And I think this is all the more reason to register your suite, especially if the amnesty program can go away in a couple of years. So yeah, yeah, I think there's everybody should get it registered because of that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's the key. Like if if we're the if we're the thing that's holding people back, then then you could I can imagine why we would continue it. But at some point in time, the onus has really truly been on an owner and somebody that might have been, you know, out of touch or ignorant at some point in time. Somewhere along the way we all look and we say, hey, if you're still unregistered with an older suite it's because you haven't tried not because you're not willing to not because we haven't given yeah. you a space to do so um and at that point in time i think any form of enforcement is is fair and and i think that, yeah i can't say for sure it'll end in 2026 but if if i was you know if i had to choose yeah. i would think that it'll end in 2026 the amnesty anyways yeah. yeah we'll be 10 years almost out from when they originally approved it at so, that point in time so that's yeah. wild yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really good to know. I, yeah, you answered all of my questions. Yeah. Is, is there anything? Kind of value for like yeah, anything we didn't touch on that you think good would be good information oh, for people to, to learn or know about? Yeah, just uh, I I mean I think that I think that um the, the city's here to partner. We really are now. We've we've shown that in our formal actions, but you know, our team is in around. Uh, we're really here to support and get you over the line, um, help you figure out what you need to do do whatever we can to, to help people be successful getting registered. And we just really encourage people to reach out, um, ask questions, uh, know what you're getting into. But yeah, it's definitely there. Definitely look into the, the incentive program. Um, you know, when I'm talking to people and for whatever reason, I can't approve them. I, 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 I wish I could. Like, I mean, that's the intention, right? We launched a program to help people with the costs. And yes, there's parameters, which means not everybody qualifies or gets the full amount. But at the end of the day, we are trying to support people. And so... I think it's um, yeah, fantastic to reach out to us. Um, it's it's a it's an important element to the overall housing requirements for the city of Calgary. Um, I know I was talking to the to the COO the other day, and just off the top of his head, forty five hundred suites, you know, and he was like, "Huh, that's like one percent of Calgary's housing." 
this year alone. So of the whole city, our housing, we have increased 4,500 suites by the end of this year. That'll be 1% of the city is Calgary's housing stock. That really puts it into perspective. Yeah. yeah, so when we talk about what we're doing um, in supporting people and people's steps towards housing individuals in the city of Calgary, this is a huge important aspect of it. And we're really excited to partner with people and get them mm-hmm. across that line, right? So yeah. That's all I'd say. And uh, I guess I'm probably supposed to say something like calgary.ca backslash <laughs> sweet, yeah. sweet dash incentive. Yeah, yeah. Sweet dash incentive. Um, take a look. Um, give us a call at 5800 uh, or sorry, 268 5300 5311. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, reach out if you have questions about it, if you're interested, if there's a property that you're interested in. Yeah, we, we can do our best to tell you whether or not it might qualify or where it looks like and, and definitely help you walk across. Yeah. So. It's really good to know. Thanks for your time, Josh. We really enjoyed this conversation. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. That wraps up another episode of the Real Estate and Wealth Podcast. Be sure to hit that like button, share with fellow real estate enthusiasts, and subscribe to stay in the loop on all upcoming episodes. Get in touch with the team at Calvert Home Mortgage Investment Corporation by calling them at 1-888-752-4642 or email admin at chmic.ca. The opinions expressed in each episode belong to the individuals featured and do not represent the views of Calvert Home Mortgage. While we provide valuable insights, consulting with qualified professionals ensures that your unique financial circumstances are carefully considered aligning your investments with your long-term objectives. Calvert Home Mortgage Investment Corporation is not a financial advisor and we cannot advise you on making investments. There are risks to investing in real estate and the potential that you can lose all of your investment.